Good morning and welcome to St Catherine's Eiton. We're really pleased that you've joined us for worship this morning. My name is Neil Robinson and I'm a reader at St Catherine's. The service will be taken from the order for morning worship in the Book of Common Prayer and I'm grateful to Wendy Tufnell for the reading and Paul Robinson for our music and hymns. If you feel you would like to know more about the church, please do make contact via All Saints Wellington website, where you will find the notices for this week and details of activities taking place. Some words of scripture. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us. Words from the book of Daniel. And now we come to our call to confession. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which you ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders, Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. God of the new day and God of love, you created us and you have redeemed us. As you scatter the mist from the hills, banish the deeds of darkness from the sons and daughters of your light. Help us to know and believe that, as the children of your love, we are free to begin again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we sing that great hymn of praise and adoration based on the Psalms, largely Psalm 105. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Praise to the Lord, who all things so wondrously reigneth. Bears thee on eagle's wings, and through all troubles sustaineth. Hast thou not seen all that is needful hath been granted in what he Praise to the Lord, who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. We say together the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The part of the psalm that we've chosen this morning is Psalm 37, verses 1 to 13. Psalm 37, verses 1 to 13. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. 
A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land, and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous, and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now Wendy is going to read to us from the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 1. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should hear his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray, a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks which they made heretofore you shall lay upon them. You shall by no means lessen it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labour at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go yourselves, get your straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be lessened in the least. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, as when there was straw. And the foreman of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today, as hitherto? Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you deal thus with your servants? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work, for no straw shall be given you. Yet you shall deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in evil plight when they said, You shall by no means lessen your daily number of bricks. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look upon you and judge 
because you have made us offensive in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Then Moses turned again to the Lord and said, O Lord, why hast thou done evil to this people? Why didst thou ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done evil to this people, and thou hast not delivered thy people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out. Yea, with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. This is the word of the Lord. Two verses from towards the start of our reading and towards the end of our reading from Exodus this morning. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. We celebrate when somebody reaches a significant age milestone of, say, being 100 years old. But even that idea is changing. A hundred years old was unheard of. Then things like diet, disease control, medical intervention, and social conditions changed. So living to a hundred is much more common today. We're changing our perception of time. I apologize if you've heard this before, but when I was appointed to my last school in 1986, 35 years ago, there were two computers in boxes in the maths department, and in those short years, life, it seems, cannot be lived without one. Phones, online orders, working from home, and the impossibility of homeschooling without one. And how do you look on the last 12 months? Mostly negatively, I suspect, and concerned with those things that we've not been able to do, shown by the fixation on when we can. We get all those memory pictures on our phones, and then the conversation begins. Who would ever have thought, dash, 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 but despite our changeable attitude and ability to pin down the concept of time, we would still say, and frequently have sung, that God is the ruler of time, seasons and life. Now you might think that is all far removed from the union dispute about bricks, straw and productivity from our reading this morning. We're happily familiar with rags to riches stories, good endings where the villain will get their comeuppance, but if we look at the time of our reading, we remember that Egypt's power and domination was built on the intervention of God through his servant Joseph. While he was alive, the former slave was the most powerful man next to the pharaoh. He interpreted dreams, planned for famines, built storehouses, irrigation channels, and was extremely rich and admired. His father, Jacob, was given a state funeral, laid to rest in Canaan. There's a plentiful peace in Egypt. And what do you know? Times change. A couple of generations, maybe, and the Israelites are thought to be a threat, put to work and treated harshly, seemingly a riches 
to Rag's story. Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, Who is the Lord? And I do not know the Lord. To try to see who is really asking that question and what lies behind it, we can look at the importance of the characters in the reading. The words come physically from Pharaoh. What do we make of him? He's powerful. He's the ruler of the dominant empire in the Middle East. He can order and command, yet he's nervous and frightened. Dictators are always nervous about what might be creeping up on them, often paranoid about it. Pharaoh is nervous about numbers, the growth of Israelites in Egypt, and fears they're a threat to the empire and his power. He's happy to use genocide to solve his problem, but it doesn't work. So as the problem grows, he is afraid of the intentions of the Israelites that they might turn their allegiance to foreign powers. Through the work, the Israelites have physically weakened. They are preoccupied with a struggle of unreasonable demands, but at least they're subdued. Then for good measure, tell them, it's all your fault because you're lazy. Now, who are the other characters? The good guy, not mentioned by name, but let's say that's Joseph. Everything was okay while he was around. The bad guy, Pharaoh. The persecuted, the Israelites. The narrators, Moses and Aaron. Now who's got the bit part? The apparently walk on, walk off. Why? It's the ruler of the universe, God Almighty. There are scant references to God from Pharaoh. Who are you? I do not know you. He mocks sacrifices as excuses. The disregard spills over into arguments between the overseers and Moses and Aaron and eventually between Moses and God. It's all as though God is irrelevant to the union dispute about bricks. In short, they've all become complacent. Sure, they will quote the covenantal promises when it suits, but they are taking God for granted, and that is a dangerous thing to do. Who is the Lord might not be just a question for Pharaoh, but just as much for the Israelites and even for us today in this reflective season of Lent. When things were going well for the Israelites, they found it easy to thank God and hold the covenant up as the reason. But wealth, sufficiency, and status always seem to erode their faith. Even the initial reaction to the hard labour seems to have been acceptable because it gave them a routine and the security of the empire. It was valued more than the freedom they attained, as we read much later in the desert journey. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve. Note that it is apparently Moses who brought them out of Egypt, not God, despite all the signs and wonders of the release. 
Do they know the Lord? The Lord is testing them and they struggle to understand messages like I am the Lord who heals you and when meat is provided then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now we can read the Bible as a historical account of events and to some extent that is true. But the main purpose of the Bible is to tell of the relationship of God to humanity and the history of salvation under God's plan. We can even relate the history to the promises made to Abraham, to Moses in covenants, but that can still leave readers immune and remote from God's purpose of salvation for humanity. The Israelites were happy to think of God as an insurance policy, somebody to turn to and only necessary when they were in trouble. The assumption was that it would take no effort on their part and that God would always be watching their back, hence taking that for granted. But God did not and does not want a passive, uncaring relationship. He wants us to understand that he loves us so much that he will choose the most miraculous and extreme ways to rescue us from the messes we get ourselves into. The first thing is to know God, to recognize his hand on our future and his unfailing nature. That is where the Israelites were, but that's still a passive response. The second thing is to respond to see the relationship, not as a bartered obedience covenant with a succession of if you, then, but a wholehearted commitment to love and service, not limited to Sunday or Sabbath, to situation or personality. In short, we're talking about believing in God, in faith. As we consider being halfway through Lent and the time to reflect on the greatest sacrifice and salvation promise, we should think about how we view the crucifixion. If it remains a historical event, no more than a story of brutal Roman oppression, respect for a man in court on false charges, to be killed to satisfy the twisted desires of political and religious leaders, then the impact is no different to Pharaoh, and salvation is a distant concept. But praise God, that unreserved rescue is at hand. The Israelites were told, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will not only let them go, he will drive them out of his country. And so it happened. God dethrones the oppressor to free his people. The history of salvation can and will proceed. It is by faith in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that we are saved, not by history or bartered obedience. Then, we recognise that Jesus gave everything, including his life, to save us from our sin, to welcome us into an everlasting relationship, and that faith 
not history, leads us to want to know more of his purpose for us. The question is still the same. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I pray that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will come to know more and more of God's mercy and grace. Amen. We say together the words of the Jubilate Deo, Psalm 100. O be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be you sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and merciful hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only Thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from us. The Collect for the Third Sunday of Lent Almighty God, of ourselves we have no power to help ourselves. Keep us outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Second Collect for Peace O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, 
may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the third collect for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we are aware of many issues in your world today, issues of human deprivation, conflict, and medical need. Father Protector, we pray for the situation in Myanmar as the military takeover exerts its power over the ordinary people who chose their leadership by democratic vote. We pray for a negotiated settlement and an end to daily indiscriminate shooting. As Brexit causes new systems and tensions, we pray for a spirit of cooperation to protect work and livelihoods without recourse to aggression and countermeasures. This morning, we pray for the Queen and the Royal Family. Particularly, we remember the Duke of Edinburgh being cared for in hospital. In your love and mercy, may he live out his life in peace and contentment. And Lord, we pray as so many times before for those working to save lives in the NHS and associated services. We catch a glimpse of progress and light following the darkness of lockdown, but call for patience and concern for the thousands still receiving medical care. Hasten, we pray, the use of the vaccines and an acceptance of regulation. Lord, you know of all the situations that we don't. By your wisdom, understanding and love and your almighty, all-powerful hand, lead your people into a world of peace with itself and with you. We pause to bring those situations known to us to your gracious throne. Loving Father, hear our prayer. Amen. And now as we come towards the end of our service, we're going to sing a hymn of promise, of dedication. O oh, walk with Jesus through this week.
past all other pathways are unblessed oh walk with jesus change the and new will bring you fragrance from each flower and hallow every passing hour Jesus a great have we to walk life's troubled path with thee? Come to us now and teach us the way, and oh, walk with us day by day. We're coming to the close of our time together online, but if the service has raised questions for you and you would like either to talk with someone or have them pray with you, please do make contact through All Saints website. Thank you once again for joining with us to worship this morning. And now a blessing. Secure in God's love, be steadfast in his service. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all, those who we love, and those we are called to love, now and forever. Amen.